So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming on this rainy day. We have competition a few yards up the hill with Hillary Clinton and, and Healy Hall. So, um, I'm Julia Lamb, and I am in the theology department here at Georgetown University. And I'd like to extend my own personal congratulations to Peter and also to express my gratitude because, as many of you know, he's one of the most wonderful colleagues. Um, any scholar could have, and he's wonderfully supportive. So congratulations and thank, thank you, you, Peter. This morning, the panel is on matters of life and death, social thought, and eschatology. Our first speaker today is Christina Astorga. She is a professor and chair of the Department of Theology at the University of Portland and has served in this capacity since 2014. She previously served as the chair of the theology department at the Ateneo de Manila Loyola Schools. Additionally, she was a visiting scholar at Weston Jesuit School of Theology from 1996 to 97 and a fellow at the Jesuit Institute of Boston College in 2003 and at the Woodstock Theological Center here at Georgetown in 2004. She was the founding director of the Center for the Study of Catholic Social Thought at Duquesne University from 2007 to 2011. In 2014, her second book, Catholic Moral Theology and Social Ethics, A New Method, received the College Theology Society's Best Book Award. Congratulations. She received her BA and MA from the College of the Holy Spirit in Manila and her PhD from the Loyola School of Theology. Please welcome Christina Espinosa. I am in ethics, and um, my friend Peter is in systematic theology, and there has been no opportunity for our fields of expertise to intersect. But beyond our common um, Asian roots, uh, Peter has been my friend for many years, uh, especially since after he visited the Philippines and has come to visit my home and my family. So I am so happy that uh, Gerard included me among his friends to celebrate this, um, his legacy, his legacy. So Peter, congratulations. My, uh, my topic is the, I have a full paper, but we were told to reduce our paper to only 15 minutes. I'll do my very best to reduce it to 15. The triple cries of poor women and the earth interlocking oppressions in the Asian context. The connection between the social do domination of women and the ecological domination of the earth is as deep as the connection between the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. In the diminishment of women, the exploitation of the poor, and plundering of the earth, we hear triple cries. Asia is a huge continent covering wide land boundaries a rich multiplicity of cultures and religions and an entire range of socioeconomic political contexts of its various countries. Asia cannot be treated, referred to as one monolithic universal reality. The first part of the paper presents the triple cries and how these cries interlock in the same logic of domination and subjugation. The second part of the paper offers a threefold faith vision, prophetic lament gender resistance, and ecological kinship in response to the triple cries. This alternative vision breaks the death-dealing logic of oppression and transforms it into a logic that liberates and gives life. When I see throngs of poor families in front of the trash bins of McDonald or Jollibee at night, scavenging for the only food that they have for the entire day, my heart breaks. I weep. In the Philippines, they call this pagpag, which means to shake. Whatever people could get from the trash bins, they simply shake and eat or recook if needed. There's something terribly wrong in a world where the poor are practically eating from the garbage bins while the rich live in wanton extravagance. The cry of the poor resounds in a world where the assets of the three richest people are far more than the combined GNP of the 48 least developed countries. 
Of far great and growing concern is the phenomenon of urban poverty in Asia, which is severely per pervasive. In the slums, millions of the poor are exposed to the filth and stance of poverty, and with no ac access to clean water and sanitation, the poor are perpetually within the grips of illness and disease. Pope Francis calls this water poverty, a poverty that is depriving the poor one of the most basic of rights. Access to safe drinking water is a basic and universal human right since it's essential to human survival and as such is a condition for the exercise of other human rights. The cry of the Asian poor is the cry of those who live in the margins of life, within the unbroken chain of poverty, extremely deprived of the most basic of necessities to live a human life worthy of persons with rights and dignity. Gemma Cruz's article on Filipino domestic workers in Hong Kong exposes how they are abused and exploited. Many become victims of physical and sexual abuse in the hands of their employees, slapped, spit at, kicked, hit with objects, and beaten. They realize their horror that they are trapped in a hellish situation. Stories of oppression of Filipino domestic helpers are revolting, but as revolting, are stories of Indian women as victims of violence. The violence against Indian women is also perpetuated by social structures and systems which legitimize death-dealing cultural practices. Dowry is punishable by, by law. In spite of that, it continues to be a widely practiced in Indian society. The estimated number of dowry-related deaths in India is 25,000 a year. Extreme and brutal forms of violence are committed, like dousing women in kerosene and burning them. Women are tortured, killed, and driven to suicide. Dowry creates a cycle of violence that traps women and their families. The unceasing claim of the dowry on families impoverishes them, as they have to sell their properties or incur huge amounts of debt. Often, they're never able to pay the debt, and many of these families see the only way in mass suicides. The cry of Asian women as oppressed and denigrated and as victims of aggression and violence must provoke a collective righteous rage against power, the kind that exploits the body and kills the soul. The phenomenal growth of China and India has been written about in recent times. China's economic growth is spectacular but it had severe consequences for the natural environment. Its economy is said to be an historic run, but it is choking on its success. Its pollution problem had shattered all precedents, making cancer China's leading, leading cause of death. Air pollution is blamed for hundreds and thousands of deaths each year. The exploitation of the poor, the diminishment of women, and the pillaging of the earth interlocks and the same logic of subjugation and oppression. How do we, in faith, respond to the triple cries of the poor, women, and earth? What does our faith evoke in our collective hearts in the face of this crisis, in this, of this cries? How can we break the logic of subjugation and oppression with a vision rooted in faith? I propose a threefold faith vision in response to the triple cries, prophetic lament, gender resistance, and ecological kinship. Prophetic lament begins with grief, with mourning. In the face of extreme poverty, where people are feeding from trash bins, the only food that they could have the day, we must weep. The cry of the poor must be our cry, for only then can the numbness of our indifference be pierced and the callousness of our insensitivity be broken. The language is the language of lament, deeply rooted in our faith tradition. We grieve because we, th we see things as they are. We see the pain and horror of the suffering of others. Fearlessly, we face in truth, which allows us to grieve with anguish and outrage, with cries of protest and indignation. Lamentation is a cry of utter anguish and passionate protest at the state of the world and brokenness. When people define reality as it is and proclaim that all is not well, then things begin to change. The lamenter's voice becomes subversive. 
It is prophetic lament not only because it gives hope to the afflicted, the victims of injustice, but it also holds the power to bring those who benefit from injustice to penitence and conversion. The lament of the victims is revelatory as it exposes the harsh truth of injustice to others. Those who benefit from injustice can be moved to join in the lament, but they have first to fearlessly face the truth that they have benefited from another's suffering and that their social privilege has been purchased at the cost of someone else's burden. The cry of women, especially the cry of Asian women, must not be silenced until it's heeded. In the end, however, it must be women who must let their cry be heard and reclaim their agency in what is called gender resistance. Resistance is rooted in our faith tradition. Biblical portrayals show that Jesus' ministry resisted and subverted institutionalized power relationships. In the same spirit of Jesus' iconoclastic resistance to power, women must cast away the robe of victimhood and reclaim their agency and dignity. When women come to a full consciousness of the premises of their lives, they create sites of resistance where they negotiate with powers of domination at their own terms. Feminist scholars who are increasingly unearthing stories of resistance by ordinary Indian women. These are stories of silent but staunch resistance to the dominating regimes. Far too often, Indian women are portrayed as a silent shadow, veiled and mute before her oppressors and unquestioningly accepting a discourse that endorses her subordination. Contrary to this image, the narratives on earth are testimonies of their voice, struggle, and dissent, which portrays an emerging consciousness that is liberative. The cry of the earth is a cry for a new order of relationship, where it can flourish in its full abundance. In the rapacious exploitation of the earth, one sees most closely the interlocking oppression of poor women and earth. The sovereignty of man over woman extends to nature, most often symbolized as female. Within the system of dualism, women and the natural world have no intrinsic worth and value. They have only instrumental value with reference to man whose needs and desires they fulfill and the scourge of the earth is the scourge of the poor. For wherever the earth is ravaged, the poor is ravaged as well, deprived of their daily bread and sustenance. This intimate relationship between the poor and the fragility of the earth is a central theme in Laudato Si. We search for a way to undercut the dualism by going back to the heart of the creation accounts. If relationship and love are at the heart of the universe, then we must conceive our relationship with the earth and all of creation in terms of ecological kinship. This is different from ecological kingship, based on the hierarchical dualism that drives a wedge between humanity and earth and places human beings in absolute dominion over all creatures. Again, in the words of Pope Francis, we have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. She groans in travail. In imaging ecological kinship, Rosemary Radford Ruther uses the metaphor of dance. We must start thinking of reality as the connecting links of a dance in which part is equally vital to the whole, rather than the linear competitive model in which the above prospers by defeating and suppressing what is below. Pope Francis speaks eloquently of ecological kinship, and I quote, if we approach nature and environment without this openness, the awe and wonder, we if we no longer speak of the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless, ruthless exploiters, 
unable to set limits on their immediate needs. By contrast, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, then sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. Because all creatures are connected, each one must be cherished with love and respect, for all of us as living creatures are dependent on one another. We listen to the triple cries of poor women and earth in the context of Asia. The cries are interlocked in the same logic of subjugation and domination. The cries should not be silenced, but should be heeded. But to heed these cries, the logic of subjugation and domination in which they're interlocked must be shuttered. The threefold faith vision of prophetic lament, gender resistance, and ecological kinship offers an alternative logic that liberates and gives new life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is David Hollenbach, SJ. He is the Pedro Arupe Distinguished Research Professor at Georgetown School of Foreign Service and a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center. Before coming to Georgetown, he was the director of the Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Boston College, where he held the university chair in human rights and international justice. His teaching and research deal with human rights, theories of justice, religious and ethical responses to humanitarian crises, and religion and political life, approached in a way shaped by Catholic social thought, contemporary theology, moral philosophy, and social science approaches. His books include Driven from Home, Protecting the Rights of Forced Migrants, 2010, The Global Face of Public Faith, Politics, Human Rights, and Christian Ethics, in 2003, and The Common Good in Christian Ethics, 2002. He has taught frequently at Hikama University College in Nairobi, Kenya, and he is currently president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, and we're very happy and fortunate to have him here at Georgetown with us now. So, David. Thank you very much, Julia, and it's a privilege to be here. In particular, it's a privilege to be saying something in honor of Peter Fon's work, and I know that our interests in refugees and migration uh, have converged in overlapping in recent years, uh, given the work that Peter is doing on this subject right now. So that is the topic that I'm going to speak upon on the set this morning. And my paper is entitled, Religious Response to Refugee Displacement, Meaning in the Face of Suffering. So, as you know, in recent decades, the forced movement of refugees and, and internally displaced persons has been rising markedly. Uh, it has reached the level of uh, forced migrants today of 67 million people, which is the highest number uh, since the Second World War. Um, many agencies are responding uh, to these forced migrants, and uh, a number of them are secular, a number are religious, religious or faith-based. And uh, if you trace the history of the development of the humanitarian movement, you can go back and see that in its earliest roots, it came out of religious motivation. Uh, there has been a kind of secularization of attitudes toward the respondents to refugee and forced migration studies. And uh, some of the work that I've done with people at the Oxford Center for, Religious, for Refugee Studies in, uh, in, in the UK until very recently, they paid almost no attention to the fact that most of the respondents to humanitarian crisis in the world are in fact faith-based organizations. I just have a, a small chart. Um, if you look at the budgets of these organizations, um, the two biggest in the world are secular, Médecins Sans Frontières and Oxfam International, with budgets of approximately a billion dollars a year. But equally large, World Vision, the largest in the United States, is a faith-based evangelical organization, which also has a budget of $1 billion a year, slightly larger. You go a little bit below that, and you're in the range of $600 million, 
with Save the Children, International Rescue Committee, CARE, and so forth. But along with them go Catholic Relief Service, which is larger, actually, than Save the Children or International Refugee Service, International Rescue Committee, and so forth. So some of the biggest faith-based, some of the biggest respondents to these crises are faith-based. Paying attention to the faith dimension of their response is really what my concern is about uh, in this presentation. Now, religious belief uh, plays a very important role uh, in the motivation of some of these agencies. Uh, we know, for example, uh, that the New Testament uh, portrays Jesus as fleeing persecution uh, from Herod shortly after his birth. Uh, we know that the origin of the people of Israel is with the migration, uh, first down to Egypt and then the liberation and being brought back home uh, to the Promised Land. We know that the first movement, uh, that Muslims count time uh, from the Hijra of Muhammad fleeing from Mecca to Medina in what might be called a forced migration. Uh, so each of these three major monotheistic traditions uh, have important founding moments that are connected with the reality of forced migration. Uh, Hindus uh, and Buddhists also have strong convictions about their duties reaching beyond any kind of border, beyond any border of a nation state in particular whether it's uh, the notion of dharma in Hinduism or the notions of compassion in Buddhism reaching out across these borders. Now these organizations, these religious traditions, are not only have, not only have positive orientation toward response to humanitarian crisis and refugees, some of these religious communities are at the source of some of the conflicts that are displacing people today. So thinking about and sorting through um, these realities uh, of how religion plays a role in relation to forced migrants, migration, especially in relation to the conflict that is a central part of the cause of forced migration in our time, is a really important uh, in a important issue. Um, now, religious belief, in addition to these sort of normative stands that can, if interpreted properly, orient religious communities to responding uh, to refugee issues. Uh, religious belief also plays an important role in sustaining those who are afflicted by crisis. Um, wars and other disasters not only kill many people, not only drive many people from home, but these disasters, if you've ever spent any time in a refugee camp, you'll know what I'm talking about. These disasters fragment the framework of meaning that sustains the lives of people. I remember uh, in one of the volumes I edited about this issue, uh, one of the refugees who had, from Ethiopia who had spent many years, 18 years actually, in the Kakuma refugee camp in northwest Kenya, wrote an article uh, describing his experience in the refugee camp and the title he gave it was, There is More Than One Way to Die. And what he meant was the experience of being in a refugee camp for 18 years is indeed a kind of death. It's a fragmentation of meaning. Now, the loss of meaning opening up this uh, domain really, in a certain sense, fractures the structure of the secular universe of meaning. Uh, and it opens up a rift in our understanding of what human existence is about that one can look into whether one is a forced migrant, a refugee, or whether one is one trying to come to their assistance. If you work for a long period of time with refugees, the meaning question becomes very real, even for the responders, it seems to me. And this fragmentation of meaning opens up two possibilities. One, one can look into this rift and say it's all absurd. There is no meaning, which can lead people to give up, despair, or it can lead people to say, I've got nothing to lose. And I've always said that one of the best places to generate a terrorist is a refugee camp. Not surprising that that's happened with uh, the Palestinians 
uh, in Israel who are in their fourth generation of refugee status. Uh, the average duration of refugee displacement in the world today, by the way, is 17 years uh, before uh, finding a new home. This is a, a, a situation that fragments the reality. One can look into that rift of meaning and either despair or find there some glimmer of hope. And it seems to me that this is one of the ways in which religious and faith-based communities provide assistance to those displaced in this way, both those who are themselves displaced, uh, but also those who are trying to assist them and come to their aid. Um, now, so faith can sustain those in this situation and those coming to their aid. Now, this points to the spiritual needs of refugees, which opens up a very interesting further question, namely how those faith-based organizations who are responding to the needs of refugees should deal with the issue of faith, how they should relate to them. This arises, for example, for the Jesuit Refugee Service that I've been working with on various ways. Uh, it arises for Catholic Relief Service in their setting too. JRS, Jesuit Refugee Service, uh, operating in Syria today, 60% of those who work for JRS in Syria are Muslim. And the vast majority of refugees in the world today are in fact themselves Muslim. But many of the agencies coming to their assistance are Christian based. So it raises some very interesting interfaith issues about how to deal with this meaning question in the framework of this kind of displacement. One solution, the solution of the secular agencies that are responding, is to just say we don't deal with that. But agencies like Jesuit Refugee Service say that's not adequate. There are religious and meaning needs here that need to be dealt with, but they need to be dealt with in ways that take genuine interreligious encounter very seriously. This does not open the door to what might be called formal interreligious dialogue, but it does open the door toward a kind of interreligious collaboration that means that those who are coming to the assistance of refugees and those who are refugees themselves can find a way to at least address these questions in a certain mutually respectful way. Uh, a kind of interfaith collaboration <laughs> very much on the ground in urgent, indeed desperate situations. And this opens the question in a way that asks us to think about how these agencies would in fact respond to the religious and meaning needs of those they, they serve. Now I'm not suggesting that this is a, uh, the prime issue, that there are, there are indeed physical needs, there are health needs, there's need for food, there's need for shelter, there's need for political advice about how to handle asylum claims and so forth. All of that is a very important issue. But what is frequently called psychosocial support for displaced people might also be called psychosocial meaning support for those who are in these situations. And how does one move forward to doing that? Uh, my former colleague at Boston College, Catherine Cornell, has written some very interesting things about interreligious dialogue that I would like to adapt to thinking about how religiously or faith-based humanitarian agencies deal with the crisis of challenge of meaning for refugees in this setting by highlighting four points that she makes about ways uh, that in a religious dialogue takes place, and I would apply these to uh, what might be called interfaith cooperation in dealing with the crisis of meaning facing those in these urgent, urgent situations. The first quality for faith-based agencies and for those working for them, Christians, for example, whether they're, whether they're Catholic or evangelical or whatever, the first quality in addressing these meaning questions has got to be humility. That one doesn't simply know what the answers are to these questions, but to be able to listen to a Muslim talk about what 
being driven from home in Syria might mean from the point of view of their faith and their belief in the one Allah, this is a very important way in which one can enter into it, even as a Christian, but with a real humility that is willing to listen as well as speak about the shared meaning. Secondly, um, Catherine Cornell highlights how another quality of interreligious dialogue that's relevant for this is that those engaged in this dialogue need to be committed to their own tradition. Not committed in a way that imposes it on others, but committed in it, to it in enough, enough of a way that one can talk about the meaning question in some way that opens up doors <coughs> to something other than saying it's nothing but despair out there. And that kind of commitment is really important. A third component, Catherine Cornell calls a recognition of mutual interconnection with those in whom I am interact with whom I am interacting. This is a precondition for avoiding any kind of condescension on the part of those coming to assisting refugees and those receiving the assistance. Recognition that I'm in the same boat with you in some ultimate way that we are, this is what the Jesuit Refugee Service likes to call accompaniment. I have to be a listener as well as a speaker because we are together in facing this crisis and being willing to address this with others in a way that recognizes mutual interconnection as humans is a very important component. And finally, that means a certain kind of empathy in willingness to respond to the, to the needs of those being assisted, the needs that are physical, the needs that are psychosocial, the needs that are indeed ultimately religious, and to respond to those uh, in a way that opens the door for a shared recognition that we're in it together. One of the things that Jesuit Refugee Service has learned from its effort at accompaniment is that being with people in these crisis situations in ways that listens as well as speaks is in some sense often the most important service that can be provided to a person in a refugee crisis situation. Because one of the things that people feel in these settings is, I have no home. I have nowhere, I have nowhere to call home. If my listening can provide a kind of new, small opening to recognition of being with another. This is the beginning of saying, you have a home at least with me. Thank you. Thank you. I just realized I went out of order before. Go in the order you got. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's fine. Followed your instructions. There. Anyway, no problem. I'm doing so, last things. I should be the last thing. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> um, so, Brian Doyle is a professor and chair of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Marymount University, as well as the director of the Center for Ethical Concerns. His publications examine the Christian doctrine of God and its practical re relevance for the believing community. Doyle is currently working on a systematic presentation of the theology of love, drawing from the biblical, philosophical, and literary sources in the presentation of a contemporary theology of love. He is active in the College Theology Society, having given several papers and convening the History of Christian Life and Thought session. He obtained his BA from Xavier University, his MTS from the Western Jesuit School of Theology, and his PhD from the Catholic University of America. Please join me in welcoming Brian Doyle. Thank you. So uh, like Christine and the others at the table, uh, I think our papers are longer and we removed some things. Um, and when I know Alan was gonna be here, so I took out the sections on the New Testament for fear of embarrassing myself <laughs> otherwise. Um, but I found myself sketching a lot yesterday. The papers we had yesterday, were, I, I found fascinating in how much the theme of borders continues to come up in so much of what we're doing, especially what David just did uh, on borders. But I found myself with, with eschatology, especially Peter's eschatology, that theological distinctions, or if you will for our theme, borders, are actually very important. It, 
borders constitute this from that, here from there. And for eschatology, life from death, body from soul, individual from community. So, Gerard, if we put this together as a feshrift, my article is going to be disagreeing with the title of the conference and perhaps the book. Um, so I want to look at those three dis, um, relationships between individual community, body and soul, life and death, uh, quickly in uh, Peter's eschatology. Um, so I'm starting with a quote. I'm going to uh, begin and end with a quote from Peter. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen his, uh, I think it's one of the most recent books he's published with Lexio, uh, publishing Dying into Life and Living into Death. It, it's, it's excellent um, and by far the funniest book he's written so far. Um, there are several times the kids are, my kids, you're laughing at one of your nerd books? Yes, yeah. yes I am. So I, this, is one of, this is in the introduction of the book and this is when I, I swallowed hard after accepting this uh, invitation. This is from Peter. Eschatology has been a constant concern of my scholarly endeavor. Indeed, my first doctoral dissertation deals with the eschatological vision of the Russian Orthodox theologian Paul Agemnikov, and my second with the German Catholic theologian Karl Rahner. Here's the sentence where you, you swallow. Even my third dissertation deals with aspects of eschatology. <laughs> Another quote for Peter. Eschatology is Christology conjugated in the future tense by means of the imagination. Thus far from being harm, a harmless appendix of systematic theology to be treated at the end of the theological curriculum, or as a treatise providing answers to our curiosity about when the end of the world will come, or how, to long, uh, how long purgatory lasts, eschatology, or apocalypticism, is in Kazaman's memorial, uh, memorable phrase, the mother of all Christian theology, without which the Christian faith would be robbed of its forward-looking and world-transforming thrust. So the eschatology of Peter Fan has, in, um, like much of his theology, developed throughout his career. You can see this mostly in living into death, dying into life, as a culminating statement of much of his theological work on the last things. This most recent text argues that death is a part of life. And as a Christian, each of us is called to live in the hope and trust in God's promise of eternal life. This hope and promise is built upon our faith in the death and afterlife of Jesus Christ, whose death is the model and revelation of our future experiences. So those of you who know Rahner's eschatology know that this is, this is the, his argument that our death is only made, finds its meaning in the death of Christ. A little bit looking at um, anthropology in relationship to death. Human life to be, is to be seen as life in community, in interdependence with the other human beings and with the world itself. To exist is to coexist in mutual relations in a community. This view marks fans' anthropology with, as communal in nature. Once humanity is only properly understood as the acts of freedom done in a material and social world that are done for or against another. Our relationships, especially our relationships of love, are definitive of us. Other papers will probably tend to this issue, but to the Joy to Read fans, dedications to his friends of his books is really something. Uh, my desk right now is filled with all fans' uh, eschatology books, which is uh, seven. Uh, and you look at the dedications of all of his works. Uh, you can see the personal uh, way in which he does that. It's not just for mom. Uh, he calls out his friends, and you can see the concern there. Death is the ripping asunder of the person. But the person is a unity of body and soul. For honor, and thus for fan, death is the final act of freedom. Our freedom, our fundamental option, brought to conclusion. This act of, is final, definitive, and irrevocable. Quote, Dying is the privileged moment of human freedom in which the person has the power to make a decision that is of eternal validity. End quote. It is the moment that we claim who it is we have become. Our process of becoming has ended. Our constitutive acts are complete. We are now saying to God, this is who I am. 
In this way, it is the most isolated in individual act and experience of a person's life. But death is also interpersonal. Death's enormous personal aspects makes it that much more interpersonal. We love our freedom to participate in our spiritual and material relationships. Or, I'm sorry, we lose our freedom to participate in our spiritual and material relationships. Death is much more the cessation of relationships than it is the cessation of brain activity. So tied to this sum, and what I really want to talk to some is the intermediate state. I have to say a little bit about time, so I'm going to do that very quickly here. Uh, not too much metaphysics, knowing who's in the room. Eternity is not simply this life made endless, but the termination of this life as we know it. Eternity is timelessness. If any of you have had the experience of teaching eschatology to undergrads, this is when they tap out. This is... <laughs> Can you explain that to me? No, I'm going to keep saying the same Ronarian phrase over and over until you uh, believe me. <laughs> Eternal life is nothing less than the consummation of this Trinitarian love in human persons, societies, and the cosmos. Eternal life is a world in which all achieve full flourishing, in which both the corruptible body and the immortal soul of each and every human person will find perfect fulfillment. It's a great definition of heaven, so thank you for that. Eternity is a wholeness and unity beyond the division and fragmentariness of our time. So now the real question that I'm asking. This intermediate state, this anima separata. Fan traces the statements about resurrection judgment throughout the New Testament. Looking especially at Paul's letter to the Corinthians on his theology of the resurrection and the first letter to the Thessalonians on the judgment of the Lord. And then I have about three pages that uh, I'll send to Alan later so he can make fun of after uh, Peter looks through those biblical texts, and, and you can see that what, what Rahner does, what Kuhlman does, and what uh, Skilovics does in their eschatology is really trace it through the New Testament, because we don't have a lot of sources beyond that of, of what happens afterwards. Yet, just like the resurrection accounts in the Gospels, there is a lot of information, not all of which agrees with itself, with each other. And so that struggle to what can we learn f for fan ends up being much more about Jesus' experience on the cross than it is um, the statements of Paul about resurrection. But then as we watch the development in the New Testament of the relationship of the spirit uh, to the body, especially in Paul, um, and there's eight different ways of speaking of the body, um, Fan then tra traces it through the Christian tradition, uh, looking at Augustine, who gives you the superiority of spirit over matter. But then to Thomas, which I think is what's really influential in, for Rahner and for Fan. Aquinas argues for the unity of the body and soul. The body is the material of the soul and materializes and individualizes this, this soul to this body. Yet Thomas affirms anima separata, but says this is an unnatural state. We are unhappy in the anima separata. Unhappy. We are, we are unnatural. And we will, it will end with the resurrection of the dead. <coughs> this history goes back to 1336. Um, if that's right, I'm about to say mean things. Um, with Benedict the 13th, uh, who tries to reverse the position of John the 22nd. John the 22nd was the first that said, when one dies, you see Christ. And then the general resurrection of the dead, you get to see the rest of the Trinity. And so at the end it says, I'm making this dogma, but if you can convince me otherwise, please do so. And so Benedict XII afterwards um, reversed that in his bull to say that, uh, the affirm the traditional teaching regarding immediate retribution, either in heaven or in hell after death, before the general resurrection and the uh, final judgment. So as we look at that development through the tradition, there's not a lot of movement in the next couple hundred years. But Fan, which is, I think, very helpful for most of his readers, always comes to the catechism. Um, I was taught early in graduate school, not, we don't reference the catechism, especially the universal catechism. We'll go to Baltimore because that one's more fun. But we want to do theology, not catechesis. But most of our students, most of our readers, are committed Catholics who are using this catechism to explain their faith to themselves and to each other. 
and then then you criticize it. The church, this is from the Catechism, uh, paragraph uh, 366. The church teaches that every spiritual soul is created immediately by God. It is not produced by the parents. And also that it is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death, and it will be reunited with the body at final resurrection. So this sets up a stark contrast between body and soul. This is the high wall of the border, and which we will have to unpack some. But the paragraph before disagrees, also from the Catechism 365. The unity of soul and body is so profound that one has to consider the soul to be the form of the body, i.e., it is because of the spiritual soul that the body made of matter becomes a living human body. Spirit and matter in man are not two natures united, but rather their union forms one single nature. You cannot talk about anything but unity and the stark contrast of what is corruptible and what is immortal. Peter recognizes that when the body and soul are separate, the person does not exist. And I think that's one of the contributions here is to emphasize person over body and soul. Her freedom does not exist. Peter affirms the view of Rana that, quote, the single and total perfecting of the human person in body and soul takes place immediately after death. That the resurrection of the flesh and the general judgment takes place parallel to the temporal history of the world and that both coincide with the sum of the particular judgment of individual men and women. That's from Rana's article, Intermediate State. So my assertion is that Peter, especially after eternity and time, follows the theology of Rahner while influenced by others, certainly Kuhlman and Boltman I see a lot, as well as theologies of the East. Um, reincarnation continues to be a topic discussed and rejected uh, through references to the Catholic dogma. Um, and so a quick story, I can't believe I'm the fifth or sixth paper we've given, no one's done an impression of Peter yet, so I'm, I'm gonna do one. Uh, Mary Mount gave, gave Peter an award uh, last year, two years ago, and he gave this fantastic speech. Uh, he pretty much, you know, restated his uh, living interreligiously. Uh, and it was really meaningful for our students. Our, Brian and I have students that are of, you know, very diverse religions, um, mo many international students, and their parents are of these mixed interreligious marriages. So he came and spoke as a, he said, I, I am a Catholic theologian, but I am Buddhist. At my soul, I am Buddhist, and my student. Well, no, he, he can't. He can't be both, and he can see. No, no, I am, <laughs> and I know that some. But some of my students, as they come straight on, you go watch this video. Go see, and what was so profound is when he talked about being neither the, both Christian and Buddhist, and therefore neither this nor that. Uh, it struck me that that's one of the reasons I think reincarnation comes up so often in his work. Well, Catholic dogma does not permit that, uh, permit that belief. It is interesting that in three of the texts, he takes it very seriously, he works through that, and reflects in a Catholic um, theological um, manner. And I think that's important. I think that speaks um, to his audiences. Uh, so, um, pardon me? I'm almost out of time? Okay. Uh, I'd say a couple things here about uh, Gisbert Kreischaka, whose um, work I did uh, um, on his Trinitarian theology. But his eschatology has a lot. And one of the things that Kreischaka does is, is un argues against this intermediate state. And he becomes influential to Ron. Um, Peter had this in a footnote. This is how I ended up on my dissertation topic. Then in a footnote in Eternity in Time, he recognizes Rahner's move from belief in this intermediate state um, to, to rejecting that, which Rahner does in an introduction to an Italian book that Rahner found, that Peter found, found for me, and if, if you look at his notes, you don't have to do much research. So my dissertation came from uh, note uh, 102 of, of Eternity and Time. So I, I'll wrap up quickly then here, um, if I can. Page seven. Um, purgatory is going to become part of this. I'm going to leave that. The general resurrection of the dead recognizes that salvation is communal. My fam, my parents are waiting for me. When I die, I'll wait for my kids. 
That is the social aspect. For me to be a person means that those relationships need to come together. So we want to find a way to talk about the importance of the general resurrection of the dead without giving an argument for the intermediate state that is metaphysically inappropriate, biblically does not make sense, and quite honestly is supported so we make sense of our prayers for the dead and our liturgy. Um, I don't think that that is, um, I don't think that's uh, influential or, or convincing. So I said I'd end with a quote from uh, Peter. This is at the end of the most recent book. Finally, to those friends who were worried about my, about my, in their view, morbid interest in death and dying, and urge me to get a life, if a bit late, I promise I won't write another book on eschatology. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. It's a promise. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. So our final speaker at this panel is Alan Mitchell, an associate professor of New Testament and Christian origins here at Georgetown. He is the director of the Reverend Joseph A. Fitzmaier S.J. Institute on Sacred Scripture. That occurs every year in June here. He's author of Hebrews and the Sacropagina series, 2007 which was a winner of the 2008 Catholic Press Association Book Award in Scripture. He has published articles on various New Testament topics such as 1 Corinthians, Luke, Acts, and Hebrews in New Testament studies, the Journal of Biblical Literature, Biblica, and the Catholic Biblical Qu Quarterly, um, and the Bible Today. He's the editor for books on Hebrews in the Religious Studies Review. He has served for eight years on the editorial board of the Catholic Biblical Quarterly. He is currently working on a commentary on 1 Corinthians, and I think a second commentary on Hebrews is down the line. So please join me in welcoming Alan Mitchell. I don't know if you know that Julia is my wife. <laughs> she knows my work well. <laughs> I've had four people uh, just in the last week ask me why this event is taking place at this time. And so I was relieved uh, yesterday to have learned that we are celebrating the legacy of Peter Fan because we love him and his work, and not because he's dying or retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Peter and I spend a fair amount of time in each other's office, offices sharing laughter. So I would miss that terribly if he were migrating to heaven or to assisted living. <laughs> Peter, thank you for your generous friendship, your refined sense of humor, and of course for your wonderful scholarship. I am honored to be part of the celebration of your ongoing legacy. Even maybe another book on eschatology. The title of my brief paper is Migration and Eschatology in Hebrews. As you know, Peter has co-edited three books on migration and has authored a chapter in each of those books. The 15 minutes I am allotted do not afford me the time to cover each of those chapters, and so I want to focus on Peter's contribution in the most recent of those books, entitled Christianity in Migration, The Global Perspective, where his offering, Christianity as an Institutional Migrant, Historical, Theological, and Ethical Perspectives is the first chapter of the book. After tracing the history of Christianity as migratory and a global religion, Peter rightly concludes that Christians have been migrants throughout their history and that migration produced world Christianity and indeed migration is so constitutive of the church that it is its fifth mark, in addition to being one holy Catholic and apostolic, is migrant. Peter, I'm sorry to say that when I contacted Cardinal Miller about <laughs> updating the Catechism of the Catholic Church to include this important insight of yours, he was not very receptive. <laughs> important in this chapter, Peter shows how Christianity inherited its migrant char character from Judaism. He made good use of the Acts of the Apostles in charting the spread of the Jesus Messianist movement to show how Luke viewed that movement's journey from Jerusalem to Samaria to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch in its first migration. Shortly thereafter, 
A second migration post-70 CE occurred with five destinations, first to Mesopotamia, then to Greece and Asia Minor, followed by movement to the Western Mediterranean, then to Egypt, and finally to East Asia, namely India. In its earliest years, Christianity became ever migratory and increasingly global. Using Acts gives the basic outline of the migration, and that's very helpful. But Luke does not provide us the information about the social realities of those Jesus messianists on the move. Agreeing with Peter's views on the migratory character of the Jesus messianist movement and supporting his valuable insight about that movement's essential migratory character, I would like to focus on another New Testament book, namely Hebrews, which will corroborate his views on how, the migratory, how migratory the Jesus movement was and how its migratory status helped to define its eschatology. I understand Hebrews to be what its author describes it as in chapter 13, verse 22, a word of exhortation or a word of encouragement. The same expression finds itself in Acts 13, 15, where Luke used it to describe a synagogue homily. And so, like many commentators, I take Hebrews to be a sermon. Furthermore, I believe it was addressed to a mixed community in Rome, made up of Jews and Gentiles shortly after 70 CE, a time when there was not yet a separation between Judaism and Christianity. This community saw itself as a part of Judaism. And so, you can imagine what it would have been like for them to be living in Rome in the wake of the victory over Judea, the destruction of the temple, the end of the priesthood, and the cessation of sacrifice. Some members of this community may have fled from Judea to Rome. Doubtless all felt socially dislocated, to say the least. Josephus, the Jewish historian, recounts the sufferings of Jews in Rome after the war. He vividly describes the triumphal victory processions of Vespasian and Titus through the streets of Rome, where pictorial representations of the various campaigns were so realistically created on stages that the war was relived by those who had not witnessed it firsthand, as though the events were unfolding before their very eyes. He says further that the most conspicuous of the spoils were those taken from the Jerusalem temple, even a copy of the Torah. Also in the processions were captives from Judea, among whom was a general, Simon, son of Gioras, who was then publicly executed. Is it not that interesting that the author of Hebrews describes himself and his readers as we who have taken refuge, or refugees? This is in Hebrews 6.18. Some commentators read this description metaphorically as referring to those without a homeland. Others take it eschatologically as those who seek a heavenly destination. Luke Timothy Johnson underscores this identity by noting that the verb katafugain can allude to Abraham and to other Hebrew ancestors wandering as aliens in search of a homeland but that the Septuagint context of the verb strongly suggests the nuance of fleeing to find refuge. In either case, he says the characterization provides a sharp image of readers who are not sure of their place in the world and are in need of what is stable and secure. And so I think the text could also refer to the actual situation of the audience as refugees people who have lost hope and are bereft over the loss of the legacy they had received from Judaism in the post-70 era. <coughs> Therefore, one need not choose between the metaphorical and the eschatological when these two meanings are uh, combined to describe the real situation of the recipients of Hebrews. In response to their social dislocation, the author of Hebrews encourages his readers to take hold of hope likened to an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast. Refugees, after all, lack security, as we know all too well from the circumstances of refugees in our own world today, and has been so eloquently spoken of by previous speakers here. 
As in other New Testament letters, the author of Hebrews presents this hope as something to attain, a goal. Very importantly, hope functions in this section of the sermon as a transitional metaphor that anticipates what follows, where the author presents Jesus as a heavenly high priest. Personifying hope itself as a high priest that enters the interior place behind the curtain in 619 helps him to make this transition. Hope becomes then Jesus himself in 620, in 912 and 924 and 25, the pioneer of their salvation who opened up the way to God. The jarring image of the uh, anchor moving into the Holy of Holies concludes an exhortation against becoming sluggish and in favor of persevering and resisting the despair that comes from the feeling that the, what they once had, they had lost now for all time. The reason the anchor of hope provides this encouragement is because Jesus himself has entered that sanctuary as the forerunner on behalf of these recipients. The author has effectively made Jesus the anchor and the object of their hope, as the high priest the recipients still have. Thus he effectively addressed their concern for the loss of that figure from their Jewish legacy, while offering them the hopeful image of a high priest who leads them to the security that they seek. When hope is the antidote to the insecurity of the refugee, it natu naturally becomes an eschatological concept. Commentators are unanimous on the strong eschatological focus of this sermon, which sees its readers as a people moving, or as Kaiserman would had said, wandering. In relation to this notion, I recall that Philo, in his tractate on the migration of Abraham, says that the name Hebrew means migrant. Since the 17th century, scholars have noticed the affinities in the thought and vocabulary of Philo and Hebrews, notably the Platonic worldview shared by both. The sermon's title to the Hebrews has stumped scholars for centuries, and so it is tempting to think that the riddle of the title may be solved with the help of Philo. The author of Hebrews viewed his readers as migrants. After all, throughout the sermon, the audience is reminded that it is on a journey that has not yet ended. They are moving toward their goal, which is sometimes described as rest, as in Hebrews 4.1, 6, 9, and 11, or a heavenly city, as in Hebrews 12.22, or an unshakable kingdom, as in Hebrews 12, 28. Remarkably, the last two destinations are apprehended in the present, since in the sermon the readers are described as arriving at this heavenly city and receiving the unshakable kingdom. And yet they are reminded that they have no lasting city here, in Hebrews 13, 14, and they yearn for a heavenly country, in Hebrews 11:16. Perhaps echoing Paul in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, where the Greek word polituma, or citizenship, suggests that it is a place where they belong while they feel displaced on earth. Thus Hebrews combines present and future eschatology in a way that asks the refugee to live in an interim state that is marked by a tension between the present and the future, and from a spatial perspective, a tension between heaven and earth. In the sermon, the tension is bridged by the specialized use of the word today, as in, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And today, if you hear his voice, Pardon not your hearts. In these texts, today is a definite period of time in which the readers must prepare for their ultimate destination. And so, in Hebrews, migration and hope are constitutive elements of eschatology. I was pleasantly surprised to discover that Peter explicitly made the connection between movement and hope to eschatology in the second book he co-edited co on migration, 
theology of migration in the Abrahamic religions. In embracing, protecting, and loving the stranger, a Roman Catholic theology of migration, the fifth chapter in that book, he wrote, movement and hope are precisely the two essential elements of Christian eschatology. As Peter points out, hope is more than just a wish or a desire or a passive expectation. He, he writes, in contrast, hope is vigilant, standing on tiptoe, a longing expectation, a leaning forward, and above all, hope is embodied in actions to bring about or at least prepare for the and anticipate the coming reality that is hoped for. Even though he does not refer to Hebrews in his definition of hope, he has defined it in terms that the author of Hebrews would have embraced. For this author sees hope as an act. I want to recall that in the earlier text, which I've mentioned, uh, 618, the readers were encouraged to seize hope. In 611, he wrote, and we want each one of you to show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope to the very end. In 1023, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. In his analysis of the eschatological nature of the migrant's hope, Peter calls attention to what really is the ground of that hope. Whereas this hope looks to the future, it also looks for assurances from the past. And Peter writes, thus eschatological hope is deeply rooted in the past. However, this remembering anamnesis is not just a private mental act not a nostalgic hankering after the good old days in the old country, the good old country. Rather, God's past deeds and faithfulness are celebrated here and now in the community of the migrants by word and sacrament so that together they can look forward, prolepsis, to the eschatological future that God promises. The final part of the last text I referred to, Hebrews 10.23, stresses that the readers of Hebrews are able to hold on to the confession of hope precisely because their faith is grounded in the promises of God who is faithful. So confirming Peter's insight that the refugees' hope for the future is grounded in the past. What I've tried to do here is to show that Peter's understanding of the migratory <coughs> identity of Christianity expressed in its eschatology, has real support in Hebrews. These texts of the sermon that I've discussed call for an active participation in one's hope with perseverance and steadfastness, as well as with the assurance of God's fidelity, which makes hope real. It seems to me that this is exactly what Peter means by hope, which is so essential to the experience of migration. Now, as you may know, scholars have little information on the author of Hebrews. Even the great Origen, after considering several possible candidates, expressed in exasperation that only God knows who the author is. <laughs> Wrestling with this question in my commentary, I had to conclude that the author remains anonymous. But now, after comparing Hebrews to Peter's work on migration and hope, I think I know the author's identity. It's Peter Fan in another life. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Well, I have to be one of the luckiest moderators because all four panelists were very obedient and, and <laughs> stuck to their time, and just four marvelous papers that I would imagine um, each of the panelists would have questions for the others, because I, I saw a lot of crossover and really interesting relations here. So since we have a full 15 minutes for conversation, I wonder if we can begin by asking the panelists if they have questions or comments for each other, and then we can open it to the floor.
really have a question, but I just I'm, I just want to express my gratitude in particular for Alan's uh, ex exegesis and discussion of the implications of Hebrew Hebrews for the notion of migration. I learned a lot from that and found it very stimulating. Uh, but hearing uh, how this fits in with the notion of hope uh, that I was trying to emphasize in the way in which the great need for hope on the part of people who are refugees, it, it just deepens the conviction that one has resources within Christianity for finding a way to to address that. So I just well, would comment David, on that. You know, when I when I was listening to your paper and I was listening to Christina's paper, I you know I was thinking that there is this overlap uh, in what we're talking about, but. It, what you did was so, both of you did was so valuable to put a face on this experience that I was trying to explain through a textual uh, approach, you know, that, and we live in, 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 a, in a world that is so broken today that it, it quickly drives us to despair, especially with regard to the situation of refugees. You know, so we do need this hope, and we need to know that this hope is active and attainable because otherwise, our lives would be so empty and void. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how, how we could endure that. That's true. I mean, I, I, I read an article of yours on religion, and you were debating about uh, the place of religion in the private sphere, because some authors say that religion should be privatized, right? But uh, you were arguing that um, if the public sphere is, uh, um, is deprived of the voice of religion, the public sphere will be impoverished. And, and therefore, uh, how important the religion has a place in the public sphere. Uh, I, I remember Lisa Cahill was a, um, arguing for the same position in theological bioethics that religion has a say in the public sphere. And it is not true because what they say is that when, when religion is in the private public sphere, public sphere is no longer neutral, right? Because they say that you bring the biases of religion to the public sphere. But there's no sphere that is not neutral. There's no sphere that is neutral, right? Everyone brings in his own agenda, his own um, ideology, and therefore there has to be some dialogue and discourse among all the different groups. So I think it's important to again emphasize the place of religion. And I saw, for instance, the place of religion in our 1986 revolution, that it was, uh, it was non-violent uh, uh, violation. It, we won the revolution without one shot of a gun because of religion because the church has taken a lead in that uh, nonviolent revolution. The same thing again, I think, with uh, refugees. Again, the, the place of religion for the refugees. And um, sometimes people would say, um, you know, they have many complaints about the Catholic Church, but I, I always say that it may have many, um, it's flawed, you know, the institution is flawed, but if there's anything about the Catholic Church is that it has put its institutional weight on the side of the poor. Um, and even in Haiti, for instance, everyone has gone out of a Haiti. But the one institution that, that has remained in Haiti and continues the work of reconstruction for the, for, for the country is the Catholic Church. If they're still there working. Catholic charities, all the institutions and the agencies of the Catholic Church is there. So I really did appreciate the um, the place of religion again for, for refugees.